I want to welcome you all to our conference call, our technical conference call. Uh, Peter uh, is off in uh, Wisconsin already, uh, getting his uh, race team together. And so I am uh, acting. Uh, Bob, I was at Bob Abbott's garage the other day, and he asked me if I was taking over this permanently from Steve, uh, from Peter, and I told him that I was just a guest host. I'm like the Jay, the Jay Leno uh, to uh, Peter's uh, Johnny Carson. You know, I'll be here. I just don't have his. I don't have his car collection. That's the only the only issue. <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining, and uh, we'll see if we have. I've got one question uh, that was written up into me, and uh, it's a question about antifreeze. And uh, Dave, who, who asked the question, wanted to know what was the best antifreeze to use for a Healy BJ-8 with a stock radiator. And basically, I would think anything that was uh, green, the green stuff would be fine. I don't know if you guys have any any different. Uh, and he's having no cooling problems, uh, no heating, pro overheating problems, no cooling problems. Uh you guys have any other uh, ideas? Where is he from? That has a big that has a big deal. In New England somewhere. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Not not in Florida with you. I'm gonna say I'm not too worried about Prestone down here right now. <laughs> <laughs> on on on, a, on on that subject, what would be a normal temperature to see? I was driving around the other day and. Um, <laughs> It was about 185, 190. So is that about normal? Yeah. When I, when I stopped, it would go up. And then when I start yeah, driving. That's about okay. right. Okay. It's about right. <clears throat> Any other suggestions? Rick, Rick, the only thing I would say about antifreeze is if you're changing it over, I always get the pre-mixed antifreeze, the green stuff, in a pre-mixed bottle, only because what I understand is they use, use distilled water, which doesn't have any minerals to it, it'll add to the to the junk that collects in your radiator. Oh. So when I replace antifreeze, I use the pre-mixed stuff because it's already it already has um mm. what's the word I want now? <laughs> See how those summit things jump out of your brain all the time? <laughs> uh, it's it's that's, distilled that's, water. That's, so it's that's, better that's, for that's make sense. In, your, in your radio. I'm not sure that it's distilled is the one that, that they recommend. I think it's deionized. And I used to think it was distilled, and I read a whole bunch of things that said, no, nah, that's got crap in it too, and deionized is the one you want to go for. And I don't care because they sell them both at Market Basket, and, you know, who cares? It's like a buck. But this is another question of the, uh, that I was also asked about uh, water 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 <laughs> uh, how uh, what are your guys experience with water water you like it Steve I have How's used it, it I, I, well running a 1275 with a recoiled radiator and a fan you try to do anything you can to keep things cool and the water water does assist in the transfer of heat that's all it does what is I'm it not, anyway? How how oh, okay. uh, are you using it with with the antifreeze? Yep. <clears throat> and how many how many degrees did you see it drop to your uh, temperatures? I would say probably four to five degrees, and the sprite yeah. doesn't big deal. Yeah. Now I've read same thing that that some people uh, think it it works best with just plain water, uh, deionized, distilled. Uh, that it works better than if you're using it with antifreeze. Uh, I think it has, if I'm not mistaken, it has some kind of uh, lubricants for your water pump as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you just use, actually the best coolant is plain water. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's much better than 50-50 antifreeze. And uh, however, it'll, it'll rust out your, uh, it'll rust out your water pump and 
other things. So you, you've got to put something in there uh, to uh, to lubricate the water pump. Uh, the other thing that, uh, now I, I tried it myself and uh, yeah, I would say that's about right, Steve. I'd say it, it's only going to drop at about four or five degrees. Yeah. It, it's, not a, it's not a magical cure of, of whatever you have. Now, the other thing that you have to think about is, and, and I started out this conversation by saying that, that this car in question had a standard Healy uh, uh, radiator, but if you've got a uh, an aluminum radiator, you can't use the green stuff. You got to use the orange stuff. So it's something to think about if you've got an aluminum radiator. You're not, not going to get the standard the standard uh, coolant mixture that you would normally get. So, Rick, is the green stuff eco-friendly? Mm. No. It's probably not dog or cat friendly either. Uh, no, as far as I know, it's not. Uh, I don't know what is eco-friendly. Is there any antifreeze that's uh, eco-friendly? Do, do any guys know? Mm. Has anybody ever used that? Uh, what's the one that Jay Leno uh, advertises, and he's the only one that can afford? Is it, uh, Gates or not Gates? Gives with a G. You have to drain all your uh, old antifreeze and cool it out of there, and it, it's supposed to be magical properties, but it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, and forgive me because the name is is not coming to the top of my head. But for a couple of years ago, it was really you know, listed as all the, the hot stuff as, you know, it supposedly, it raised your boiling temperature so your car would never overheat and all this other good stuff. However, I think what it did was, it, you know, it didn't, it just meant your engine was going to run a lot hotter. It didn't magically make it go down or anything like that or cool it off. It just meant the boiling temperature is higher. Your radiator wasn't overflow, over boiling. However, you know, in my mind, it just meant that if if you got your engine hot enough, you were still going to do damage to the engine, even though you might have a a, a happy little radiator, but you know your your head was probably not too. I just, did, I just did a quick uh, uh, Google on Jay Leno antifreeze, and Evans comes up. That's what it is. That is that's it, Evans. Yeah. Has anyone ever tried it? I no. thought about it. I thought about it once, but uh, I decided against it. But um, you know, the, the, it also has the benefit of never having to be re replaced, according to the manufacturer. Hmm. It's, yeah. not, it's like fifty bucks. It's not overwhelming. Yeah, but the it, it's only really usable if you just rebuilt the engine or, or started with a new engine, because you they sell another product that uh, uh, clears out the old. Uh, you, you can't mix it with water at all so you have to have it uh, completely cleaned and they sell a product that helps you do that and then you, they also sell you a test that uh, detects how much water is left in your system before you can put the Evans in so it's a process unless you've you've uh, just rebuilt the engine and there's absolutely no uh, coolant in it and it's it's you know it's uh I can't vouch for it, but it's uh, I, I I thought about it once, but I decided against it. Kind of like silicon brake fluid, you know, you have to get everything. Right. And if I remember, the thing about the Evans is, if if you leave any water in there at all, uh, it it uh, yeah, that's that's what I meant by them, that's what I meant by them offering a, a product to eliminate yeah. the water and a test uh, to do sort of a litmus test. And if it comes up more than two or three percent water still in the system, you know you can't use it. So it's 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 a bit of a pain if you're trying to convert to it from a, a conventional water ethanol system. Uh, excuse me, a conventional water antifreeze system. Uh, if you're starting with a brand new engine, it might be worth thinking about. Well, I thought it was more expensive than fifty bucks. Oh, well, fifty bucks. You, you can get a four. You can get a four pack, four gallons for one hundred and eighty nine. I think. Yeah, I think that's might be somewhat more and then you know as it's been said it's just the idea of clearing out everything else is a major pain in the neck 
what, yeah, what's, got the, what, got what's the, the and everything else to worry about you know well what's the coolant capacity of these engines i have a bj8 i'm still learning the thing <clears throat> um what maybe, i don't know i think maybe about two gallons mr abbott do you have an idea yes i would say two gallons on an empty radiator and an empty engine will will bring you right up to the to the above the plates that you can look down at and see. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. I say, I'm I'm just curious. Still still learning with the, the beast. <laughs> well, that's my that's all my uh, pre pre uh, set up questions. So does anybody else uh, have any? Uh, one question back to the one question back to the antifreeze. Yeah. How often, how often uh, should you change it? I don't know. I do it every couple of years. Two, three years. Yeah. I mean, I think you know some people do it every year. I do it every couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know. How do you dispose of it? Uh, a lot of the. the uh, uh, like hazardous waste, auto zone, wherever you buy it from, they'll they'll take it back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my re my recycling center takes antifreeze. Yeah, a lot of the you know around here, a lot of the uh, uh, local towns have a uh, hazardous waste disposal every six months to a year, and dump it off there as well. Yeah. You know, and that's a. Actually, that's a really good place to dispose of that stuff. Is is uh, you know your has your local has its waste between oil. Again, uh, a lot of these places are required to take back the oil. I don't know if it's the same with antifreeze. You know, it's the antifreeze brake fluid you might want to dispose of, etc. And if you put it away and you got someplace locally that'll take it back once a year, that's that's all to the good. Yeah. I was having lunch with a couple of my my high school friends uh, today. And we were just talking about how we, we used to do oil changes. And, uh, you know, we, we used to, some of us had gravel driveways. We said, well, by the time we <laughs> do oil change, we'd have a, we'd have a, a, a tire of our driveway. But they, they, don't, they don't look kindly upon that anymore. Yeah, all, 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 all the more reason to save your uh, um, windshield washer jugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, I, I've, I've, I, I've got I've got a question for the hive mind on a glitch I've got with my car. Um, the tack is we reading weird. Uh, it, it almost seems like it's reading double. So on a normal city street, uh, it was you know you can obviously hear it's it's not pulling a lot of power, but the tack was reading about you know four or five thousand RPM. And on a on a slow lane on the highway, it's 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 it, it's up you know above red line, but it's obviously not 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 doing that. Um, uh, I really don't even know where to start. It's a you know it's electric tax, so I've so I've cleaned whatever contacts I can. It it, it reads it's going in the right direction, but it, but it almost seems like it's going double. Mm -hmm. Any any ideas? The BJ8, right? Yes. And now I'll just throw this out here. That's all I know about BJ8 tax. There is a small piece of there's some wiring in the back that can cause it to mess up. And I'm going to throw it right to Bob Abbott because he knows all about this stuff. The wire in the back won't have anything to do with it reading double. Okay. The wire in the back. If you if you if the run if you run the wire that the loops the wrong way, it just won't read anything at all. Um, I don't know of, you know, I don't know how electronically uh, good you are with stuff like that. Uh, but I don't do try to rebuild tachometers. I send them out. Okay. It's obviously, it's obviously messed up. I mean, it shouldn't be reading that high. You should be going to 4,000 RPMs that um, it going through the neighborhood is, is is just you're certainly not turning those kind of RPMs like you said. So right, I, uh, uh, where would be? You can use uh, uh, 
West Valley Auto out in California. You'll find anybody like that on the on the website. Okay. On the Chile website in the members only section. Okay. Uh, has your car been have you has your car electronics and uh, do you put an electronic ignition in it? Because uh, when no. I did when I put an electronic ignition in mine, I had to send a tack to New York, the that that place on Long Island to get reset so it would work with the new uh, electronic ignition. Yeah, no, no, this, the, this is the, uh, this is old school. Oh. Hmm. It, it's weird because it, it, it seemed like only just started recently. Uh, hmm. When I got the car, it always seemed to be idling high, like about 1500 RPM or so. And so, and I, well, I'm not familiar enough with what it should sound like. So I just thought it was idling high, but it just may may have been reading high. And last year, even even early this year, when I was going down Route Two or whatever, you know, three thousand thirty five hundred RPM, which would be almost normal. And suddenly, it's it's reading you know six thousand RPM, going not fast. Hmm. Just just bizarre. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so you so you say the, the those instrument overhaul shops are on are on the on the national website members member section or on the, or yes okay it's also on the, it's also on the uh, Austin Healy Club of New England uh, okay. website so okay. on the member section all right uh, on the on the member section okay good yeah. thank you any other questions. Mm. Mm. Well, this is going to be a short call. Well, I've got a question. Uh, I'm at the sort of at the end of uh, my build, and now we're uh, uh, one of the things we're talking about is tires, and um, I'm wondering um, uh, how how large tire uh, you guys have put on. I saw the the, uh, the Rawls car up in um, uh, Lime Rock last week, or I guess it was the week before, and he was running two hundred five seventies. Um, what's anybody's experience with a larger, uh, a larger footprint? What kind of car is it? I'm sorry. Uh, it's a 60, uh, BT7. I, uh, on my BJ, BJ8, I run 185, 70, 15s. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they clear fine. 205s, um, I, I can't speak for that particular car, but put bigger than that on a BJ8, you tend to rub on the inside. Okay. Um, panels on the on the on the front wheel wells but uh that's my own the, the 185 70s have been been fine and I, I think but i i do know people have had trouble with 185 70s on bj it's it's mm. kind of interesting <coughs> yeah, yeah. Fine, it's going to give you a lot heavier steer, steering as well much yeah. heavier yeah. much yeah. heavier you're going to feel yeah. it you know it, if you if you put a wood steering wheel on or a reduced diameter steering wheel and those wide, high, wide tires, you're going to be Jack Armstrong to steer that thing. <laughs> yeah. It'd be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. I figured that. I was considering that too. Yeah. Okay. I've also seen 175, 75s on cars, which look kind of nice because they're a little taller and they, oh. uh, they, they have a nice look to them. All right, 175, 75s. Mm. All right. So, Bob Abbott, what do you recommend for a BJ8? Um, I first I run 165. I think that's as close as I can get to what was originally one originally on the car, and and you know I'm not a hard driver. I don't I don't drift through the corners or anything like that. So I. It has plenty of traction for me, and I think that it 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 keeps my speedometer working properly and reading right, and various niggly little things like that. That that just I just stay with as close as I can to original. Just to clarify that, that would be one sixty five eighty fifteen, right. correct? Yeah, and the one seventy the one eighty five seventy is the same overall diameter. So you say one sixty five what? 165 what? 165. Uh, what did you say it was? 165. Well, it, it won't say. It won't say. It'll just say 165.15. When you get when you get at a at a uh, 
higher aspect ratio than 70, they just don't, or 75, they don't list it. So 165.15 will be 165.80.15, but it won't say that. It'll just say 165.15. And you know it's it's not a, a low aspect ratio tire. That's probably something that you might want to do on a, on a BJ8 phase two, where you've got that gap that's always up there between the top of the the tire and the top of the uh, and the bottom of the uh, uh, fender opening. Yeah, and that's that's why I said about the one seventy five seventy fives. They they got a little taller. They fill that gap up a little bit better. Yeah, they might have, they might have an impact on the, on the speedometer reading. Go so I have a question about my hundred. I my speedometer when I'm my speedometer reads sixty. I'm really doing about fifty. Is that because of the tire diameter? Could be. What's the tire? You know, I don't know. I'd have to go out and look. But they're breeder seats, but that, I don't know what the size is. But you have to be pretty tall to make that kind of a difference. You won't be getting any speeding tickets. Anything <laughs> <laughs> uh, really. Yeah, I would check check to see what your your spin on, your uh, tire size is. It also could just be your speedometer is off, but you know I don't. Yeah, it could be. I don't know what would do that. You know, mechanically. Uh, well, a mechanical speedometer works on a magnet on two on a disc, and it, it gets old. Yeah, it just wears out. <clears throat> um. So that's that's the one that's on the the, uh, the uh, gearbox. Is that in yeah. the gear? The yeah. Yeah. The the, the, oh. the drive comes off the back of the gearbox and goes right up into the back of the speedometer. Right. And inside right. there, there's a there's a flat metal disc, and it turns a magnet, and and the magnetism trying to spin the disc raises the needle. Yeah. It's a it's it's a it's a funky system. I mean, it works pretty well when it's right, but over the years, it's just worn out. Well, it's only 62 years old, so. Yeah, I'm, well. Replacing. Yeah, but you're only 61, so <laughs> it ought to be working right, right? Well, I've, I've owned it for 62 years, so. Oh, okay. As young, uh, like us, it moves faster as it gets older. <laughs> in, in our dreams. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, uh, you know, we're talking about speedometers. This, I've got a, a mine failed early last year. And this year I finally took the uh, transmission tunnel cover off. I haven't done it before, so it, it took a while. I have a, I have a Triumph Spitfire also. So I get kind of as similar, it's just a matter of finding all the screws. And I found that the right angle drive had sheared. So, um, so I took that out, and uh, there was when I took it out, the the whole brass fitting that went into the into the gearbox came out with it, and it took a long time to separate the two. And then I put that brass fitting back in, then put new drive fitting in, and uh, it worked perfectly for seven and a half miles, and stopped again. Mm. Uh, and and yes, I did put the space the spacer washer in. So uh gonna go down to a buddy of mine's house down in Rhode Island tomorrow. We're gonna eat those Heelys. And so uh so we're gonna spend a day, maybe two, <laughs> mucking around with it. But um does that uh has anybody had that that problem too with uh you know things failing almost right out of the box? And when if I were to replace it again, that fitting that went into the gearbox, uh it's got it, it, it's got, if I recall, it's got, kind of got a set screw where you 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 screw the the right angle drive in a certain amount, and then there's a uh, actually no, I think a set screw is it, it adjusts how deep the fitting goes into the drive into the gearbox, and then the right angle drive screws into that. Um, is there any, anything else I should be looking for? Or is it just one of them there are things? First thing I would do is check the right angle drive. That's right. First thing I would do is check the right angle drive. Brand yeah. new, 
out of the box, aftermarket, they're crap. <laughs> they just are. Okay. Um, my instrument rebuilder won't rebuild a right angle drive if it's an aftermarket part. Uh, they don't have good gears in them. You might, it could be that your speedometer is dragging too much and it's too much pull on that right angle drive and that's why it snapped. But it could also be that the drive is just no good. Yeah, so um, well, I have the speedometer. Have of my, you know, uh, 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 you know, talking about that, the magnet, I, I have my speedometer out and I took it apart just to take a look at it. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty neat system. Um, and so I had an old, uh, um, an old uh, drive cable. Put that on a drill. It went, it did in reverse, and the speedometer acted just right, and the and the miles or the tenths of miles clicked over just right. And okay. uh, I just tried it for maybe a mile reading, yeah. and put it back. Put it back in the car and after seven and a half miles. It stopped again. So and and so the the cable is not turning. That's a friend of mine said. If you if you unhook the cable from the back of the speedo, if that inner cable is turning, then your speedo is faulty. If the if the inner cable is not turning, then it's your speedo is probably fine. The cable itself is fine. So the only other part is the right angle drive. So I've got to pull it out again. Yeah, you can pull it out without taking the transmission cover off. It's just it's just, it's just hard to reach, and you okay. need a long pair of needle nose pliers to get up there and move it an eighth of a turn at a time. And but you can unscrew it. Okay. It's a car. Well, uh, uh, let's say I'm going to a friend of mine's house. Uh, he's got a shop, and we're gonna you know put up on jack stands. And we, you know we I got the car a couple of years ago, and this gave us a chance to really go under it and lubricate everything. I just changed the the gearbox oil. I use the uh, the red line uh, oil and um, uh, and then while we have it up, we'll do all the grease nipples, uh, do our engine oil change, check the trans. Uh, what what oil do we use for the differential? Can you use a 8090 gear oil? Okay, so just uh, um, just 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 your just your basic stuff then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing. Nothing fancy there, but do check the right angle drive. Does that, if that, they can break, brand new. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was. A, I, I think I still have the old one. I, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure the one that throws things out. <laughs> if, if you do, you can send it out to, to the West Coast, and they will rebuild your old one. For okay. Fifty bucks. Okay. So look at your old one and see whether. It has a snap ring on the on the back side to hold it all together, or the side that sticks out. If it's a crimped plate in there, it's a where you're looking at the round section of the right angle drive. If it's a plate that's been crimped in, then it's it's aftermarket. If it has a snap ring in there, it's original, and he will rebuild it. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try. Gears and drives in them, and, and who's who's that, Bob? That rebuilds them. Um, West Valley Auto Instruments out in Reseda, California. West Valley Auto Instruments. In questions, please. Don't be shy. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. How many people went to Lime Rock? I did. How was it? Oh, it was great. It was great. I hadn't been there in 50 years and it just, uh, very nostalgic. It was great. Really, really good. Yeah. Walked around and got a, a paddock pass. And uh, like I said, that's where I saw the Rawls car. Drooled over that for about two hours and then uh, um, watched them, uh, you know, watched them run. I, you know, that what was really fun was watching the, uh, the 9-11s. They, those guys go for blood. They were just out there. I guess maybe it's because you can buy panels or something like that, but they were really, they were just, uh, I know two of them were rubbing when they went through the, uh, um, uh, the S's. I was down, um, 
where the uh, Sam Posey straight, then it makes the right hand turn. And then just before it starts to go back up the hill there, uh, they were they were door to door, which was really interesting uh, to watch. But uh, it was great. Big crowd. A lot of fun. It always amazes me that there's no stands there. You know, everybody just walks out and they put their chairs down and then you can just watch anything from any place. Really a lot of fun. Great take. Really a lot of fun. Going back again. <laughs> we had uh, Peter uh, was Sturdivant was regularly posting on our Facebook uh, page uh, pictures uh, and videos from from the weekend. Uh, a lot to do with the Rawls uh, race team. And, okay. and if you go back to our, our Facebook page, you'll you'll see a lot of that stuff there. They had, for the first time I've seen, uh, they had a streaming camera uh, of the races. And unfortunately, as far as I was concerned, they had it at the, the end of the straightaway. And they just had one view. And so all you saw was cars coming by Pretty much one at a time. Really? Uh, you know, you didn't you didn't see a lot of, you know, cornering and stuff like that. I yeah. think maybe you know next year if they put a few more cameras around the track, particularly you know through the S's or yep, you know, into the downhill turn, it would be a lot more interesting. Uh, Fun I mean, place was so over uh, on the the bridge, uh, just before they they hit that first turn. You could see yeah. who was really powering through and and uh, and uh, who wasn't. Yeah, that's a. That's a good place to stand. I had hoped to uh, be able to take the um, streaming video and uh, edit out the uh, the parts that were non Healy related, but the streaming video is about nine hours long, and, and my oh. computer, yeah, no mass. I can't take nine yeah. hours downloading. So yeah, that, really, that idea went right right down the tubes. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's actually it. It's conclave and uh, the uh, event before conclave mm -hmm. uh, be really interesting as far as the race goes. And uh, they've got a, a large number. I think there's hundred cars going out to conclave. If I'm not mistaken. Wow! wow. It, it'll be quite the event, and and it may be the last huge event. I don't know. <clears throat> And how, long, how long will the Rawls people be here? Uh, I think I don't think it'll be down at uh, in uh, Mansfield. Wait a minute, let me look it up. As if I can do this regularly, I just I don't do this well. Uh, let's see. Cause there, there's a show in in uh, Mansfield, I, I believe. To fly in and uh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, there's a fly in there. Yeah, and uh, apparently they're going to be there. Okay. Do you know if if uh, Bill and Rose are going to be there as well? I I assume they probably are. I don't I don't know them. I don't know who you're referring to. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bill and Rose uh, are uh, Jack's parents, and oh. they they came over for our Beverly uh, meet uh, a few years ago. They're lovely people. Bill, Bill's a really funny guy, very entertaining. Rose is a sweetheart, and, and she does some of the best baked goods you'll ever have. <laughs> you know. So yeah, it would be it would be good to see if the, if they would uh, come back and uh, and do that. That'd be nice. Uh, okay, here it is. Here it is. Reminder: new date, September twenty eighth. VJMC British Car Fly in Mansfield. Uh, let's see. Come meet Bill Rowles and see FSL 2466 BRCC Austin Healy race car, fresh off racing in the Healy World Challenge at Road America at Elkhart Wait, uh, Lake, Wisconsin. So that's the, the new date is um, the 28th, September 28th. Okay. Now, British if you've ever seen J Jack race, he is a real hot shoe. I mean, he, he, oh, yeah. he is a real racer. And, and we actually have some uh, videos not only of uh, him racing at Lime Rock, but him racing in in, in Europe and England uh, mm -hmm. in the past, and he he can drive a car. And uh, apparently, he was driving. I'm trying to think what it was. Uh, I think it was a Janetta uh, at Lime Rock, and he started out last and finished first. So you can 
see how, how this guy drives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a number of videos I've managed to find of Jack Rawls on YouTube. Yep. And um, they're, they're in, in the cockpit cameras. And like you said, he is fast and he is good. And he starts at the back and how he just winds his way through. It's they're a lot of fun to watch. Oh, yeah. 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 So you know, if you don't if you don't see him on our Facebook page, uh, go to YouTube and uh, look up Jack Rawls, and there's there a lot of his uh, you know racing. And if you if you enjoy Healy racing, it's a lot more active in the UK than it is over here. It's just you know, and yeah. Yeah. and so there are a lot of a uh, lot of videos of uh, Healy racing, a lot of videos of Sprite racing, uh, which is can be a lot of fun. And uh, it can be very entertaining. What a beautiful car. Yeah. Really, it's just beautiful. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, uh, David Thompson, who, who does a lot of artwork, and I know a lot of you have his artwork, uh, Peter um, got him to commission uh, a, uh, a, a cutaway of Jack's car, as well as the other Healy that was racing from, from that. I forget yeah. the jump that was racing, and they David had it in his booth at Lime Rock, uh, unbeknownst to uh, Jack. And Jack kind of walked into the booth and was looking around. All of a sudden, he saw, "Hey, that's my car!" And I get <laughs> really thrilled to, to see it. So, you know, but yeah, that'd be very, very interesting. Uh, which car sense. is that? I've seen him on YouTube racing a 100S as well as a three. I think it's a red 3000. Yeah, it's yeah. number 12. If I show, if I put a picture up here, can you guys see it? Yeah, uh, if I can allow you to share it, which I think I can. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see here. I took uh, a bunch of pictures of it. This is. I don't know if I. I don't know where should I move this to there. Uh, fire. There you fire. go. Yeah, red one, yeah. Yeah. That's the one, number 12. Yeah. And uh, let's see what else I got. Yeah, that's the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And then the, uh, this is cool. That's the business end of it. <laughs> nice. I asked him just that it was his son, I think, that was there. He, uh, I, I, this could be the dream sequence, but I think his son took it out first. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Nice, nice young man. I said, just out of curiosity, what's a motor like that cost? He said, probably about $42,000. So I won't be getting one of them anytime soon, but, uh, he's, uh, older, he's got a younger brother that's out there. His name is, is escaping me right now, but you know, for which I apologize. No, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. But you know, really interesting to see somebody of younger age as, as we look around at all the people that are on this call and yeah. see that's that interested in Healy's and that interested in, in so it's yeah it, yeah yeah nice yeah. It's out there uh, about a year ago i had the good fortune to be at their shop and uh they've got some wicked cool stuff up on the second floor in storage oh yeah oh, yeah yeah that's uh it's pretty wild. I you know I don't even know what half of them were, but uh, some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Nice, not, very, very nice people too. Did you see Bill's uh, Firebird? Bill, I may the, have. I a may have. Friends I am that he 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 brought over to England. So I think it's pretty pretty cool. Yeah. But you're right. They're very they're very nice people. Very hospitable. They they have. Uh, uh, Natas and Nibbles, which is basically a chance for people to visit the garage. They do it during the summertime, and and they serve nice food and 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 give a chance for people to talk. And you know, we're we're lucky to have them as sort of friends of friends. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I've I've been there. I, I wish I got to know them years ago, but uh, there was a period of spending a lot of time down in Southampton or near Southampton, about 20 minutes from where the shop was. Yeah. And the, the film I've been doing a project with there has, has had a string of Morgans and it's got a BJ eight and one of his hangers and stuff. So that's, you know, anything with uh, 
anything old with 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 cool entrance. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's what we do. Yeah. Speaking of racing, I don't know how many of you remember Jim Smith, but I know some of you do. And yeah. Jim used to race at Rock. Uh, hundred. And uh, it recently came up uh, for sale on Bring a Trailer. And it had been uh, redone, uh, re-restored uh, a, a number of times. It, it turned out to be quite a bit different than what it looked like when Jim had it. It was Healy Blue. And uh, he had a, a, a couple of uh, shunts while he was racing in Lime Rock. And some of them involved club members. And we used to go to Lime Rock as a, a rather large group. And a lot of the people were his, his pit crew. And it involved slapping the car back together overnight, you know, over Sunday. He'd have an, he'd have a, 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 an accident on, on Saturday. And then Sunday is no racing. So that was all put the, put in the beaten, you know, taking a uh, knockoff hammer and trying to pound out the, uh, the uh, fenders uh, so they he could run on Monday. And I was looking at this car that had been completely redone and that had all the bills that uh, went into the restoration. And I'm, I'm reading this thing about how the, how the bad body work was, was repaired. <laughs> and I'm going, well, I know how that happened. <laughs> and it, it turned out uh, the, I had happened to mention on bat that, that, that I had, known the owner of the car. And the only way we knew that it was his car was that somewhere along the line, there was like one picture uh, of what was restored. And we're going, oh, that's that's Jim's old car. And uh, I think I mentioned that to the new buyer and he said, geez, you would like to get some more information. And Bob Bender was, was a good friend of Jim and also worked on his pit crew. And I, I put them together. I don't know if they've got in touch with each other, but I hope they get a chance to share some of the history of that car. Mr. Bell, tell us about your your new uh, club down there. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it, it was it started out very interestingly. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the only other club down here that was acting uh, or acting in a way that helped uh, Healy owners was Tampa. But Tampa is a long way from Southwest Florida on I seventy five, so people would go to one event a year, and that really is not what a club should be doing. So uh, with, with some of the other movers and shakers down here, we, we got the idea that why don't we just make a local club, go through, all the, go through all the paperwork and do what we have to do. So right now we have 33 members. Okay, I mean, I'm, oh, wow. I'm amazed, 33 members in the club. Some people are doing dual membership with Tampa, and some of them are actually uh, snowbirds who right now are, are in places like Ohio or Wisconsin or or. Michigan, but uh, they're here during the winter months, and uh, we hope to maybe push it up to maybe 40 members that come this fall, but it's a lot of fun. It's uh, starting all over again, Bob. I mean, I'm I'm sorry, Rick, I was just thinking of uh, Bob Estabrooks, who joined the club not that long ago, and yep, yep. we're talking about incorporating new ideas and, and, and getting people to do some different things, but when you have an eclectic group of people coming from all over the country, everyone brings their own ideas, so it's kind of fun learning new things to do with Healy's. <laughs> so we got, are they recognized? Are you recognized by the, uh, the national club? Oh yes, absolutely. We were, we were adopted as of uh, January of this year. And so uh, we, are now, we are known as the paradise coast. Come oh, on well. and visit. <laughs> Austin Healy club. Yep. So when we die, that's where we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, 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 Everyone, everyone knows uh, that New England's a very strong club, and it's it's amazing the training. You know, Bob Abbott will tell you this, Ted will tell you this, Norm will tell you this. All the all the folks that I know and yourself, Rick, we've had a we've had a heck of a run with New England, and there's been a lot of people who stepped up to the plate and made it fun, and uh, we've learned a lot, and uh, we're very fortunate being one of the largest clubs that there is uh, that we've always had things to do and people to to run them. And that's not the case with a lot of clubs. A lot of clubs are small. People are aging out. Um, and so they struggle. So it's kind of fun to get a new club rolling. I mean, it's certainly the age is still the same down here, but everyone's excited about it. We're having a good time. Well, that's great. Good. That's really good. Yep. 
No, I've got, we, I've got a, a, a Dave Francis in Connecticut. Uh, I've been in and out. I had a problem with my main computer. I'm on my wife's uh, iPhone. I hope you can hear me. It's mm-hmm. working out. Um, last week, I, I uh, last month, I, I mentioned my BN4. I'm driving it. And I picked it up last October. Had some work done to it. Um, but um, uh, driving it uh, in August and uh, July and August, I drive it for eight, 10 miles and it's perfect. And then it would start sputtering and backfiring. And, uh, and I thought it was a vapor lock problem. I, I really couldn't attribute it to anything else. I, I asked the question last month. I threw a Pertronics um, uh, electronic ignition in and uh, God, it's, it's perfect. Uh, put 60 miles on it yesterday, uh, but the weather's a little bit cooler, which may be a contributor. But um, I don't know why, if it was vapor locked, I don't know why an, an electronic uh, ignition would be the solution, but it seems to work. Part of spark, maybe? Yeah. 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 What about the carbs? Any chance that the carbs were the, uh, the needle valves were getting stuck? Uh, no, the carbs were rebuilt uh, in uh, about three months ago. We played we played lots of games with the with the uh, needles to get them to optimize them and everything else. And uh, and and every time I was working with Dave Silverflight at uh, Bug Eye Guys in Brantford, Connecticut, and um, uh, you, you take the car out for a test run for four or five miles, it's perfect. But then you drove it for ten miles and it went downhill. But uh, I don't know. It may be the cooler weather. It was the, the weather this week, uh, you know, in New England, as you know, has been absolutely marvelous. And uh, as I said, I took it for about a 60-mile spin yesterday and um, just absolutely perfect. Make, made me glad to have a Healy. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens next July. I'll, t- <laughs> I'll tell you next week, <laughs> next month. Hey, well, you know, on the, on the uh, dash pot oil, how, what's a reasonable time between topping it off? I have a feeling that mine is leaking. Is it, is this something you sort of have to top off every week or? Oh, no. Oh. Okay. Maybe filling it. If you overfill it, that stuff will come right up the, t- the top to the uh, damper top. Well, I, I I topped it off uh, maybe a month or two ago, and really didn't drive very much, maybe three four hours. And I checked right now, and I couldn't see any oil in it. Wow! Both of them are empty. Uh, well, not empty, but I couldn't, but I couldn't, I couldn't see any down there with a when I look with a with a light. You should only if you unscrew the cap. Excuse yep. me, Rick. If you unscrew the cap and push it down in, if you can hear the oil squeezing by it before it gets down to the threads, you've got plenty of oil in it. You may not be able to see it, but you, the, 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 the piston will go very far down before it needs to contact the oil. Right. So I if, mean, you're it, the, it, if you're filling the tube, you're just it's just blowing out and passing through the carburetor and you're burning up that oil. It seeks okay. its own level, and it'll be quite happy there for a long time. So, so I, as long as like when I, when I take the the, the filler the brass cap the, uh, to take that off, and then put it back in, I should feel resistance before right. be, before right. the threads engage. And yeah, you won't you, you won't yeah, you won't see the oil at that point. Yeah, you know, it it displaces a lot of oil. Okay, okay, because uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's I was I was wondering about that because that's and if you thought, I don't know where it would leak you'd have to have a crack or something in the piston so I you know I don't I don't so know how what, what I what I did a little while ago I took the cap or the the dome of of each carburetor off and just cleaned them you know, they're sort of black inside so I used carburetor cleaner and wiped it down and you know put it all back together and it worked <laughs> so that that that's always good but. Uh, uh, I'm I'm catch I'm catching up on it, learning it. Uh, so I'm going to be working tomorrow with a friend of mine down in Rhode Island, who that his business is restoring these old cars. We're just going to spend the day 
and I'll bring a toothbrush. You never know. Um, and just uh, just learn all about it because that's kind of what he does. What What's the preferred oil for BJ8 in the carburetor? I, I was I was using like some zero W twenty fifteen I I forgot but what what, what I, I happen to have some that, that I use my Subaru which is a zero W something or other. Some people use the Marvel Mystery Oil. Moss sells a, a an oil specifically for that, but it's probably some common oil. It's, yeah, it's probably, it's Mar probably, Mar 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 probably Marvel Mystery Oil. Like five. oil. Uh, seven, it's eighteen bucks, but they don't designate the type of oil. Yeah, it's probably something you can. It's probably some ordinary oil, a three-in-one oil. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it should last forever. I mean, if I suspect, Mike, that as Bob said, you you think it's leaking because as you push that piston back in, you displace a lot of oil. Then you can't. Then it looks like it's a lot a lot lower than it was before. You know. Okay. Okay. So so ideally, when it's proper and you take the cap off, you shouldn't really see any oil. Right. No. Okay. Good, thank you. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading something here. It says the correct amount is about a half inch from the top of the cylinder. If you put in the damper dampener and you meet resistance and you hear a gurgle sound, you have enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then and, and, and the damper is that that the little piston about that big. So it's a, it's it's about the size of a of a of a of a, of a pencil of yes. a pencil eraser. Yep. Okay. Thank Any you. other? And all of it, as far as the, the correct oil, any thin no. oil you can use will be fine. You can buy Marvel Mystery Oil in a small container, and that'll be plenty. You could buy three-in-one oil. You can use automatic transmission fluid. Any thin viscosity oil will, will work perfectly yes. well. Sometime so any, ago, straight, uh, any straight 20-grade oil is fine. Some time ago, uh, somebody... I don't know whether it was on this show or whatever, but they said uh, mobile, uh, mobile one, which is, uh, and uh, I guess that's a twenty. Uh, I've forgotten what the viscosity is, but uh, I've used it in the last few years. Um, two cars, my Triumph and my uh, uh, Austin Healey, and it seems to work at all temperatures. So. That's that's the advantage of multi viscosity oils. Yeah, yeah. They 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 work fine at various temperatures. Yeah. Okay. I think I think it was a fifteen fifty was the recommendation from the, a guy that does Tom Bryant up in Wiscasset, Maine, who re, re, he rebuilds a lot of SU carbs, um, and that was his recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Mobile one fifteen fifty. Yeah, I think that's what I have. Yeah. I have a little dispenser that I can just squeeze it out easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was using one of those little plastic pipettes and probably three or four, th three or four or five milliliters. It wasn't a heck of a lot. I heard people using uh, sewing machine oil. Uh, you know, I, I guess you're partner might not be happy with that but yeah you go That's online and you could you could find just just about anything 2050 or 20 or somebody was recommending 90 <laughs> but uh so there's there's a whole variety of uh, recommendations sdp will work real good so everyone else's uh, healy is running just fine and they, you don't have any questions as best as best they could be it's a british <laughs> car yeah. Anybody do anything good this week as far as uh, working on that car? Uh, Taking it to Conclave. Who's going to Conclave? Any of you going to Conclave? Steve? Yep. Is that it? Up. Yeah? Hey, what are you going to take out? The Sprite. I, I have one question. <clears throat> on my driver's side door, I have that uh, BJ8. <clears throat> the damper that holds the door open. And I find that uh, if I tighten it enough to hold the door, it begins to, uh, the, the mechanism, the threads begin to spall and then it doesn't work. And I bought two of them from Moss and 
I'm just have I just can't get it to get it adjusted right so that it holds the door open without deteriorating the threads that you for the nut. Has anybody got any advice on that? Nope. <laughs> How about all do that? What's that? They all do that. They all do that. What is there any trick? Do you lubricate it more, or do you? What do you do? It, no, uh, you don't want to lubricate. I can destroy the thing and not have it work, and I, I can't tighten it to get it to work. So it's a, the right side seems to stay fine. You don't use the right side as much. <laughs> yeah. that? You don't use the right side as much. Right. Yeah. When you buy a new when you buy a new doorkeeper from from Moss, does it come with a disc? With a yes. friction disc? Yes. Okay. You, well, don't lubricate that. No, no, but you, you lubricate the threads so they don't spall. What happens is the threads seem to spall with the nut, so they kind of strip. If you get it tight enough so it'll hold the door open. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, I, I don't know that you're doing anything wrong. You might be... You might not be happy with the door closing on you all the time, but well, sometimes they, don't, they just don't work very well. It's a very yeah, rudimentary that, system. Yeah, that, but one thing that does work, I take a uh, a piece of wood about this long and I prop it against the windshield and the door and that works fine. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> my, car, my, car is, my car is the same way. The right, the right one works, the left one doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, mine works so far. Mm. Okay. No, so, or, or, or 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 just or, you know just when you get home, make sure make sure your butler holds the door for you. There you go. <laughs> or or park the car on a downhill slope. Right. Right. <laughs> Steve, are you going to yeah. be going out for racing, or are you just going out for the conclave part of it? Just going for the conclave. I've got a few other little odds and ends you want to do on the way there. Um, it's just a, it's a good time to go north for a while and cool cool things off. It's been a very warm summer here. <laughs> Anything further from the group? Well, uh, I'll let you know how our adventures in the Healy tomorrow go. Well, that, that'll be good. Uh, Interesting, yeah. It's always good to hear back after we, we give advice to people what to fix, and it's nice to know whether it ever works. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an adventure. It always is. Hey, Bob Abbott, I have a Sprite question for you. <laughs> You're the Sprite guy? What do you mean you have a Sprite <laughs> question for me? Well, something Go came ahead. up. The only thing that made me think of it we have a you, New England has a new club member down on Long, I, Long Island who has an inner Chenny spider. I've been working with him. He's not a car guy. He's he's had to take it to a place to have some things done, and of course that has a it has dis, a front disc brakes, like the Mark III Sprite or the late model Mark II Sprites, which took a special master cylinder, the three quarter inch bore. The company, huh, well known company that he brought it to in Connecticut put a 7 8 bore master cylinder in it. And I'm of the opinion that is incorrect and it's going to change the braking ratio from front to back brakes because it has the wrong bore. Have you had any experience with that, Bob? Not with front brakes on a Sprite, no, Steve, I haven't. I don't, okay. I don't know. But but it will change the braking. The, 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 yes. larger, the, the larger the bore... Mm -hmm. The more fluid you'll move, but the less pressure it'll create. Yep. So, so the drum brakes, the drum brakes uh, on the on the bug eye came with the the seven eighths bore, and when they came out with the front disc brakes, they changed it to a three quarter inch bore. Yeah. And uh, that's why I'm concerned that we have a shop that's putting the wrong master cylinder in cars uh, with disc brakes, and it it may it may be moving too much fluid you're right okay you know, just i would ask it's going to change the way the brakes operate and and how far off the how much 
pedal travel you're going to have. I think with the, the larger bore, you're going to get pedal travel that's going to go down to the closer to the floor. Um, I'm trying to think when when we did uh, Nick Zarkady's car uh, that had a, a disc brake conversion, and he hadn't changed the, the master cylinder. Mm. And of course, my guy, you've got the master cylinder, you, you, you still want to keep the same clutch pedal uh, and the same bore for the clutch. And uh, most people, they end up buying a different master cylinder. The one on my car was from a, I think you're right, Steve. I think it was a, a master cylinder from a late Mark II. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. that was probably correct. Yep. That's what works fine in my car. Yeah. But I think you're right. I think that that, that may be not the right one to do. Um, you know who I think he still does it? Uh, Gerard Charter. I, I, he's got a French last name. Do you know what I'm talking about? Gerard. Gerard me? Bernie? No. Uh, Charter. Oh. No. Uh, he, he's mm -hmm. been re coring, uh, re sleeving yeah. my guy on this for years. Yeah. I'll show his address to you. Yeah. I don't know if he's still doing it. He was doing it for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people now that the inner Trenti was based on the Mark III. Correct. For breaking, so, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think what they have because sometimes when you do a, a conversion some people can also from on a bug eye will will convert the uh rear master so the rear brake cylinders not the master yep. but the well yep. um and depending now i never did that on mine i had a standard 948s on that yep. uh but yeah some people uh, let me shoot you his email address and, and okay you might, that would be good thank you yeah and, and see what happens yeah yeah that's that's a little you know it's bad when you when you start trying to do stuff with the chances and you know, everything is just so much, a little bit different, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and not too many people are experts. I think you not know. Anymore. Oh. <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else, folks? Well, thank you all sure. for joining. Uh, I will uh, be able to put this thing up on our, on our YouTube page. Uh, in a couple of days, in case you want to, you know, relive all the fun. Uh, and we also have, I think I told you last time, we also do, uh, when I post these on YouTube, I, I list the, the topics that are on there. And if you go on the, on the search in the YouTube, uh, the, the second part of the search box, if you've got a question with a tachometer, you can tap that in there and, and come up with the, uh, uh, the uh, video uh, of the uh, the episode we had that talks about that. So it, it's kind of a, a nice way to, if you miss one of these and you want to see if there's something that covers your, your question, uh, you know, feel free to do it. You know, if you can't possibly wait for the, the extra next four weeks till the next one of these things comes up and that'll be. Good. Thank you, Rick. All right. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, yeah. Rick. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. All, yeah. welcome. all great to see you all. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Hey, Bob.